and we're waiting on a blessing. And we're also, this candle right here, it has a name. Do you know what that candle's name is? Okay, well, it's got a new name since the beginning. Now it's called the Not Yet Candle. Because we think like it yet. Okay, so that is the Not Yet Candle. <laughs> okay, all right, can we hold hands? Can you hold hands with me? Well, not only with me, but can we hold hands? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for these children, Lord, and for what they mean to this church and Lord, for what they mean to me. They are a blessing, each one of them, in their own unique, specific way, Lord, they are a blessing. And Lord, I thank you for their parents. I thank you for Bud and Selena that bring them to church, Lord. I ask that you will give them a special blessing this Christmas season and just let this family grow spiritually with you, Lord, and grow in blessings, and maybe even grow in patience as we wait for blessings to come our way. We ask that you be with this church, Lord. We ask that you will bless this church, Lord. You've done it for many years, and we just ask that you continue to bless this church. Bless preacher Russell and Elizabeth, Lord. Be with him this week as he has his procedure done, and Lord, we just are mindful to give you thanks for all the many blessings that we have, Lord. Thank you. We love you. Amen. Amen. When Debbie started off with the children this morning, I said inside my head, I didn't say it out loud, I said, oh, great. Now she's going to preach about Zechariah and take my sermon from me. But uh, that was just good timing because she gave an aspect of it with the babies, with Elizabeth's baby, John the Baptist, and Mary's baby, Jesus, and the two women meeting together. It sets the stage, I think, for what I needed to say here this morning about the mystery in a major. Zechariah had spent nine months unable to speak. And it happened because he had acted in unbelief. Uh, nine months prior, an angel had appeared to Zechariah to tell him that his prayers had indeed been answered. His wife, Elizabeth, was soon going to bear him a son. The conversation between the angel and Zechariah went something like this. The angel said, your wife, Elizabeth, that one who has never been able to give you a child before in all these years that you've been married, she can bear a son. This time, next year, you will have a little three months old. Zechariah said, are you nuts, man? I am like a zillion years old and my wife is past all that, way past all that. Well, some things never change, do they? Both Abraham and Sarah had laughed when an angel came to tell them that her 90-year-old body is going to produce a son the following year. And Zechariah was a descendant of Abraham in more than one way. I used to think it was rather cruel of God to make Zechariah speechless for nine months just because he asked that question. Well, I'm a lot older now and just a little bit wiser, and I see the point. Zechariah was going to be the father of Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist. He was going to be the father of a prophet, and if Zechariah was going to be the father of Jesus' forerunner, John the Baptist, Zechariah was going to need all the faith that was available to handle his responsibilities as the father of the most important prophet since the beginning of the world. Zechariah needed time to think. You know, when you talk a lot, you don't think much. And so God shut Zechariah up until just the right time. And on the day that John the Baptist was born, Zechariah had not said a word in nine months. And when that child was born, Zechariah had come full cycle in faith. He'd obviously done quite a bit of thinking. And everybody looked to Zechariah when they asked Elizabeth what the child's name was going to be, Elizabeth said, his name is John. 
And everybody turned and looked to Zachariah. Why? Because nobody else in their family was named John, and you always named the firstborn after one of the family members. <laughs> Zechariah couldn't speak still. So he took a chalk and a slate in hand, and he wrote in big bold letters, his name is John. And that changed everything. Zachariah's mouth was open. Nine months of silence brought repentance. And Zechariah was now a believer. The result was a prophecy and the praise of a converted heart. There's a lesson in that for all of us. If you sin, even big time, and you sense that you're laboring under the rebuke of God's Punishment? Remember Zechariah. Remember that the Lord forgives and he even turns our rebuke sometimes into a reward. God took faithless Zechariah and he made him the faithful prophet and the father of John the Baptist. So if you are a Zechariah today, remember you can come home to faith. Question. What did Zacharias say once his tongue was loose? Once he could speak again. Well, it's recorded for us in Luke chapter 1, verses 76 to 79. I want you to get the idea that like I'm holding my Bible, Zechariah was holding his child, John, the one that they would call the Baptist. And he's talking to him. What did Zechariah say? These first words. And you, my little son, will be called the prophet of the Most High, because you will prepare the way for the Lord. You will tell the people how to find salvation through forgiveness of their sins. Because of God's tender mercy, the morning light from heaven is about to break on us. He gives light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and to guide us to the path of peace. What did Zacharias say? He told the good news. He said all that needed to be said about the birth of Jesus. The prophecy of Zechariah centers around two major facts. And those two major facts separate Christianity from every religious thought or faith system in the universe. The first of those two thoughts is we have a God who shows up in person. We have a God who shows up in person. And the second one is we have a God who forgives by grace. Do you know that no other faith system in the world, in the universe, has those two as ultimate beliefs? Zachariah spoke of a God who would give light to everyone that sat in darkness. He talked about a God who would guide our feet into the way of peace. This is a God who showed up in the person of Jesus Christ in a manger, the most unlikely of places for a king to show up. This is the mystery that showed up in the manger, a personal God who has taken on the flesh of men and visited us. God who entered time and space. And that God forgives by grace. There's no doing, there's no achieving that you can do work to be absolved of your sins. You can't work hard to stockpile good karma through your good deeds in this life and somehow make that okay between you and God. That's not what God has said. Jesus Christ, a God who shows up and forgives by grace. That is the mystery that was in the manger. It's the mystery of Christmas, the shadow of a cross over a manger. Only in Christ is there the correct understanding that we are lost in darkness, and that darkness is our sin. Only in Christ is there the God who forgives our sin by his grace. Only in Christ has God come and paid the un thinkable, unpayable price of death so that our sins could be forgiven. Only in Christ has there been resurrection. 
and only in Jesus Christ is their life. Well, here we are in Advent. First week, second week, third week, fourth week, then Christmas Day. <clears throat> Eighty years ago, there was a man who was one of my heroes who was sitting in a jail cell in Germany. His name is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who's a pastor. He was imprisoned by Adolf Hitler during World War II. And he wrote to his fiancee many things, wrote a lot of good stuff that you ought to be reading, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. But he wrote to his fiancee one time about a lesson that he learned from life in prison. And this is what he wrote to her, one of those romantic things about a prison cell. He said, a prison cell in which one waits, hopes, does various unessential things, and is completely dependent on the fact that the door of freedom has to be opened from the outside is not a bad picture of heaven. Isn't that the truth? Here we are. Here is all humanity in darkness. And the prophet says that great light is going to be brought. It doesn't say that man is going to provide his own light. It says that light will be provided for him. That is the picture of Advent. God, who is light, brought the light to the darkness. And those who sit in darkness will see a great light, Scripture says. So what do we think about how God did that, how God does that? What does it mean to be loved by a God who understands us enough to have a shadow of a cross over a manger containing his only begotten son? I want to tell this in, a, in the voice of another. Uh, it's a story that comes out of the last century. Dr. Maxwell Maltz was a famous plastic surgeon. One day a woman came to him and said, Dr. Maltz, my husband was injured while attempting to save his parents from a fire, a burning house. He couldn't get to them. They were both killed. And my husband, she said, his face was burned and disfigured, and he's given up on life. He's gone into hiding. He, wouldn't, he just won't let anybody near him, see him, not even me. Dr. Maltz told the woman not to worry. He said, with all the advances we have made in plastic surgery, I want to assure you I can restore his face. And she explained, doctor, that my husband will not let anybody near him because he believes that God disfigured his face to punish him for not saving his parents. And then she made this shocking request of the plastic surgeon. She said to him, what I want, what I'm asking for is for you to do surgery on me and disfigure my face so that I can look like him. She said, if I can share in his pain, then maybe he'll let me back into his life. I love him so much. I want to be with him. And if that's what it takes to do it, then that is what I want to do. Of course, Dr. Mall said, sign the Hippocratic Oath taken the oath, and so he was not going to do harm to that woman's face, but he was absolutely moved so deeply by this wife's determined and, and total love. So he got her permission to try to talk to the husband and convince him. And he went to the man's room and he knocked, but there was no answer. And he called through the door to the man. He said, I know that you're in there and I know that you can hear me, so I've come to tell you, my name is Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I'm a plastic surgeon. I want you to know that I can restore your face. No response. Again, not. Please come out. Let me help you. I want to restore your face. Nothing. Still speaking through the door, Dr. Maltz told the man what his wife was planning to do what she was asking him to do. He said, she wants me to disfigure 
her face to make her face like yours in the hope that you will let her back in your life again. That's how much she loves you. That's how much she wants to help you. There was a moment of silence. And then ever so slowly, the doorknob began to turn. The disfigured man came out to make a new beginning and find a new life. He was set free, brought out of hiding, and given a new start by his wife's love. She didn't need to be disfigured for him to love her. It was her love that made him love her. Something of a dramatic expression of human love that gives us a picture a tiny picture, a faint picture of the saving love of Jesus Christ. It's what we call the atonement. This gift which God gave us is that mysterious manger. Jesus Christ becoming what we are to give us who he is. Amen. It's a gift. And you can't buy it. You can't earn it. You can't inherit it. You cannot find it by chance. It is entirely received with open hands and bad knees. It's given by a God who shows up in person. A God who forgives by grace. Now, the only thing you should not do with this kind of gift is act like Zachariah. Don't imagine that it can't be done. You open up your mouth immediately and say, yes, Lord. And you be faith-filled and live. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to celebrate together the lighting of the not-yet candle. Why does Debbie call that the not-yet candle? It's because... That's the Christ candle. That's its real name. We call it the not yet candle because we're still waiting. It's still Advent. We light the candle in the hope of his coming. We light the candle because of our faith in his coming. We light the candle because it's a promise of him to give us who he is because of what we are. Heaven was prophesied. The same Jesus lives today in our hearts. He deserves our highest loyalty and total commitment. In Jesus Christ, our hope is fulfilled, our love is consummated, our joy is complete, and our peace is filled. Go in the name of Christ. Have a blessed Christmas season this year. Amen. Mm -hmm.